So, uh, my name's Peter. I've been designing and developing journal sites since, uh, I guess, late Mambo days. Um, I'm not, actually, no, I am extremely biased towards Joomla, but I do use other platforms. I do use WordPress, I do use Drupal and Magento as well. So, um, I like to make sure that uh, the client, whatever site, whatever solution they're after, whatever situation they're in, they get the best solution, best platform that will actually suit them. Okay. Um, I run PB Web Development with um, uh, my team there, um, and yeah, I started that about seven years ago. But more recently, the more, more interesting thing that I've been doing is the podcast. I've been interviewing people around the world about Joomla, uh, getting really connected with the Joomla community and connecting the Joomla community together as well through the podcast. So if you haven't heard it yet, and you want to listen to some amazing interviews with experts around the world, jump onto the Joomla Beat website, joomlabe.at, and you'll find a whole bunch of podcast interviews. And um, even Tenko, who is on after me, I've interviewed him a couple of times too. He's a very switched on guy. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, now this presentation is all about SEO, uh, specifically for the mobile. It is not the basic stuff. I gave a basic SEO presentation a few months ago at the Sydney Jug. <coughs> so I would like to get some sort of indication of the levels of that people are at in regards to search engine optimization for the website. Who's a novice? Okay, um, who's like on page one for all the key terms that they're after? Okay, all right, cool. No, awesome. Um, I'll go through a really quick rundown of my Sydney presentation, just to go through a couple of the key points. Um, but if you want the rest of the slides, I'll just post up the links. Uh, I called it seven ingredients to search engine optimization. Made people pretty hungry. There's um, 78 slides there. I'm just going to fly through them really quickly. Yeah, the podcast thing, great. Keyword rich domain names, absolutely fantastic. Try and get an old domain name, keep up. Title tag, uh, make sure they're keyword rich, keyword inclusive. Don't overdo it, you don't want keyword stuff. <laughs> How quickly can I do this? Uh, title tags have a certain character limits. Control your title tags in your articles. Control your title tags in your menus. Uh, meta tags for everything that you do. This is a really quick rundown, just for the people that, um, that haven't seen this yet. Uh, now I'll put all the links up to this as well. I just want to point out a couple of other things. The canonical URLs, I'll talk about in a moment. Last but not least, microdata. Has anyone started using microdata in their websites? No one? Really? Okay. Um, there are microdata schemas for any type of content that is out there on the web whether it is movie session times, whether it's recipes, or anything like that, you can use microdata schemas to really take advantage of your search engine result listings. I think I did a screenshot. For example, when you're doing a search for a movie session time, let's say you're searching for a movie session time here on George Street, you're looking up the latest Iron Man movie, I have absolutely no idea what's out there these days. But if you're looking at the latest Iron Man movie, you can search for that session time on Saturday evening and instead of taking you directly to the page of the site, it will come up with a little snippet, a rich, rich snippet of text that will say Iron Man 3 showing at 6.30pm. And you don't even need to go into the website to actually see that data. It comes up as that little rich snippet search result before it even gets into the site. And that's also very relevant when we're looking at mobile site optimization. And this is why I wanted to get into that. So sorry about that really quick rundown. If you want to know more about this, Ruth Cheesley from the UK has been doing a lot of presentations around the world in the general community talking about rich snippet microdata. Micro, yeah, microdata for your search engines. So look that up. It will will change the way that you use and optimize your websites. All right, let's get out of this. Cool, okay. 
So let's talk mobile optimization now that I've sped through that. So why is mobile search so important? This, this guy apparently pioneered the mobile phone. I, I would think I wasn't even born yet. Um, that phone's huge. So why is this so important? It's mainly because of the huge growth rate. We've heard this all before in other presentations, so I don't really need to go through it too much. But mobile search is changing dramatically. This guy here is Trey Ratcliffe. He is a photographer that travels the world, gets paid to take photos in amazing places. And of course, Google gave him a pair of Google uh, glass, glasses. I met him up in the Gold Coast a few weeks ago and he gave me a little demonstration. So the way that we're searching is changing and the way that this information for the searches is changing as well. So how do you optimize for a device like this? When they're swiping something on the side of their head and a little bit of information is being injected, not injected, <laughs> laser <laughs> projected, that's the word, projected onto their retina. How on earth do you optimize for this kind of stuff? User behavior is going to change and continuously change as well. And we have to adapt. Now, this kind of stuff is extremely hard to measure. Like when uh, Trey was using his Google Glass, he was pulling up search results from various websites, but he was never actually going to any of those websites. And what Norm was saying earlier this morning, when he was doing, what is it, chicken parmigianas? Chicken parmigianas, uh, they'll get the number at a certain time. You click on that number, they don't even go to the website. Do they go to the website? Can you get to it from the search results? Yeah. They'll see it in the search results, they don't even go to the website, they'll go straight to the phone number. And that's something very different, something you really need to think about when optimizing your site for a mobile user. If we take a look at this example, uh, I just did a search a little earlier for pizza in Ultimo. And this is a perfect example. So when you do a search on your mobile phone, you come up with a couple of search results. I can see, like, in the Tomo Cafe, uh, now, from that point, I could visit their website and get all the details, but I don't actually need to. And if I don't, that doesn't actually register as a click-through. So I actually never see them on Google Analytics or any of my tracking tools. So how do I even know? And if I didn't optimize this site, what's at half time? What? Uh. And if... <laughs> well, <laughs> So if, if the user, it distracted me. So now if um, the user just presses the call button, they'll immediately call the restaurant and they can do an order. Uh, so that user will never actually go to the website. Or if they click on the directions, if they want to walk there, it will be an in-store purchase rather than an online purchase. And that isn't tracked via the website either. So if I just click on the call button, my iPhone throws that up, so I would just immediately call the person. And if I have a meat lovers pizza, I guess everyone, most pizza restaurants have it, I'll just order that. Or vegetarian, what vegetarian option? Yeah, you get the idea. So, in, in understanding this, uh, what we need to do is actually try and collect as much data as possible, or what we can get, from Google Analytics. Now, who considers themselves a really advanced user of Google Analytics? Yeah, it's they've changed it so much. So they change it every day. I know they change it constantly, and they've released another Google Analytics Academy. So if you really want to understand your users, really understand the information that is coming to your websites, check out the Google Analytics Academy and sign up. It's free. Yeah, it, um, and you can lead to a Google Analytics certification. I think that's fifty dollars. Uh, and I did some podcast interviews about that, so you can listen to that too. But here, yeah, another shameless plug. Sorry. So here we are looking at some of the data specifically for what mobile users are looking at uh, on my Jumblebee Beat website. Now I can see the very first one there. The very first search result is for a episode about Joomla three point two. So some of the new features that were coming out. Now, I was, and I had some help, but some people were prolifically tweeting about that. So I know a lot of my traffic was coming from mobile users, uh, specifically, specifically from Twitter. 
So now that I know this information, I need to optimize my website accordingly for these particular users. Now I can drill down further. If, if you get me at the pub later, I can show you how, really how to drill down some of this data. When you go into Google Analytics, you can look at the analytics page, you can see all the information. But we can actually segment that down, segment that down to mobile specific users, and tablet users only, tablets and mobiles, uh, and so forth. There's so many different segments and so many Ver, um, what's the word? Versus uh, options that you can do for all those that segmented data. It's very cool. But here, what it did also was did this keyword breakdown of that mobile the, of those mobile users to see exactly what they're trying to search for on the mobile devices. Now, this doesn't really make sense to me. People are looking for Instagram icons via mobile devices, and the the ones that are not provided at the very top. That's a very interesting change at the moment because a lot of keyword search results are coming through aren't being tracked anymore because they're being hidden by Google's SS, SSL searches so a lot of that information isn't being passed through anymore either so I uh, have to find out ways around it. Has anyone experienced that? Yeah. Yeah, so you're suddenly losing all your keywords. Yeah. We started using other tools as well like other third party uh, analytical tools to actually try and benefit and buffer that and if you use Bing for example which may be a bigger player now they don't hide all that data so you can still get that in the Bing search engine tools for equivalent to uh, Google Analytics and Webmaster tools are actually very good so it might give Bing an advantage I don't know it's a very all over the place fluxing search engine optimization market for me. Okay, so understanding user behavior. Um, these guys will never understand, but they're, they're, they're funny to watch. Bondi hipsters, if uh, anyone's out of town. Google it. Hilarious. So we have to understand what the mobile users are doing. We have to understand what they're trying to look for on your website. And then we're going to optimize the website based on what they're after so they can get that perfect user experience. <laughs> So now that we we have that information, we can plan for it. So um, we have now before I go on to the next bit, um, Google Webmaster Tools allows you to fetch your website in different ways. So Google Webmaster Tools will fetch your website as a desktop version or different versions of mobile um, version fetching as well. Now this will give you a lot of information on what and how your website is appearing. It does come up in code though, so it's a little bit confusing. But if you can go through that code, you can actually see how your website is being treated by Google. I think I did a yeah, fetches Google mode. Okay. So when you log into Webmaster Tools, who's, who hasn't used Google Webmaster Tools? Okay. That's the very first thing you should do. Make sure you link up Google Analytics with your Google Webmaster Tools so you can collect this data. Without Google Webmaster Tools, you won't know what keywords people are using. Maybe you won't now anymore anyway because they're hiding all the uh, keyword results. I reckon what they're doing is they're gonna get that keyword data into uh, Google Ads, so now you have to pay for that keyword information. I think it's, it's, the it's, in, the, it's in the enterprise version. So you do have to pay for it. Well, I think it starts at 100,000 US a year. Oh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> link, up, link up Google Webmaster Tools so you can get some of this information. And there's optimization tools in there as well to really uh, help understand what's going on with your website. Don't quite have $100,000 to play with. Um, that's ridiculous. Anyway. You'll see that extra little option there on the right hand side next to the fetch button. You can change how uh, Google is fetching and those different results will appear. So now, optimizing for the web. Now, the other presenters today have spoken a little bit about this, so I won't replicate or duplicate the information that you've been fed already. Um, but there are basically three ways that we can present information on mobile devices or any tablet devices as well. The very first is responsive design, and probably the most popular. It adapts to any device. It's a one URL, 
so you don't have to worry about some sort of like mobile dot Joomla dot org URL or m dot Joomla mobile URL. It's easy to maintain because you only have one site and one site to manage. Uh, it doesn't have to deal with any redirections either. So you don't have to wait for your mobile device to get redirected to the mobile friendly page. It does take a little bit of time and if you're using a third party service that's doing this, uh, I can't remember what the name is, I think like Mobify was one of them, it will take you off to their website, wherever it is. So if you're in Australia and you're trying to connect and using that third party service, it will shoot it off to the States creating a bigger delay and lower your user experience in general. Now the next way is dynamic content. Some of these images, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. Um, so that another way of doing it is with dynamic content. So with dynamic content, there will be one URL still, so it's kind of like working of the way a responsive <coughs> website will. But with the dynamic content, it will change depending on what device they're on. So the browser will do its detection, find out exactly what device they're using, and you can throw them a different type uh, or customize or uh, specific device content for that particular user. So if they're not iPhone, you can give them a shorter paragraph of text that fits perfectly on their iPhone screen. If they're on their desktop, you can give them that bigger bit of text with the image as well, so you can make it very customized and very personal experience. Of course, there are downsides to this. If you're building <coughs> content for different types of devices, you're basically replicating and creating a whole lot more work for you, so it does take a lot more to manage. But it can really increase and improve that user experience in the end. Now, last but not least, I was talking about that parallel mobile site. Don't know why my seven greens came up again. Last but not least is that mobile parallel site. So, a mobile site built specifically for the mobile user itself. Now, that's this is really easy to do. It's very quick to do as well. Uh, you will need to probably duplicate some of your content and do very mobile specific stuff in that regard. But there are some disadvantages to this. Uh, it's so they're all three. Sorry, skipped ahead. Uh, there are some disadvantages to this, and one is the duplicate URLs and the social sharing. I think I've got another slide on this, unless it died. So they're the three, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about which one should actually use. Now, I think it was in June this year, the CEO of Google basically I, I don't expect you to read that, but basically what he said was mobile-only websites like the m.joomla.org websites look crap on my Nexus and I don't like it. So let's make everyone go responsive by not making their sites appear in Google search results. So to satisfy his user experience, he's, they've basically changed the algorithm so that will appear nicely on his Nexus for a tablet or whatever it was because he was getting thrown all these funny looking mobile websites that were made specifically for iPhones and he didn't like it. So that's been forced into their algorithm and you have, we have seen changes in regards to that. We were building a site for a client that had the M dot domain and then we realised, hang on, this isn't going to work. We're seeing search results from other search engine optimization people saying it's starting to have an effect and we moved out of that. Okay. So responsive web and probably mixing in dynamic content is probably the way to go. You probably get the best results out of this, but like I said before, it's going to take a little bit more work. Planning your content for each single device is going to take a lot more work. Ah, why do you have to do it? Life is so complicated. Instagram down, okay. This is a slide about the social sharing. <laughs> so more and more these days we're seeing uh, that, that M domain. if people are sharing content from there and they're sharing it to my desktop, I'm going to get a mobile experience on my desktop. I can't remember who said that this morning. Was that Anthony? I can't remember. 
But in those regards, social sharing should all point to one domain. It shouldn't be pointing off to different domains. You're diluting your page, uh, page juice, search engine page juice, by diluting it off to an M dot domain, as opposed to focusing all on the proper domain. Now, there are ways around this. Does anyone have an M dot, uh, like a, a subdomain or parallel site? Oh, that's good. But if you ever do come across one, here's some tips to get out of it. Um, now, the redirects are slow, like I said. It's so very old. But the way to get around it is to use some meta tags that Google have provided. Now, this is the relationship alternative tag that you should be using on any of these websites. It essentially tells the search engine that there is a mobile page for this and should consider this and call this as a mobile page. And on those mobile pages, throw the user back, or to, not the user, sorry, throw the search engine back to what the proper desktop version of this is. This is really important so you're not diluting your search engine rankings across a mobile friendly page, mobile parallel page, and a uh, desktop version of it, because you have the two duplicate content pages happening. And that is the example bit of code that you use to push your mobile only page back to your desktop friendly page. Okay, any questions so far? Does that have the same effect as a 301 then? Yeah. It does? Yeah. You, you'd have canonical, canonical URLs everywhere else on your website too. Yeah. Well, you should. Okay. Now, like I was saying, building these kind of um, Websites, it's kind of like building a multilingual website. Has anyone done that? Huge pain in the ass, especially if you're throwing in a lot of languages. Basically, you build one site and then you get translated to translate all that text and do it again. That's kind of the path that we're going down as well, trying to build specific content for different devices to really optimize that user experience. All right, so I've dumped all this information at you, but how are we actually going to do it? What kind of paths can we take to actually make this happen? And what's some really easy ones that uh, you don't need to be a developer for to actually make this happen as well? Now, my favorite way is to use Advanced Module Manager. Probably a lot of you are already using it. Who, who uses Pete stuff? Oh, not that many. Great. Yeah, this is a fantastic component extension that makes your module manager incredibly flexible in, in relation to what it can do. Uh, it extends the way that and how modules will appear across your site. And in this case, what I'm using is the options to make modules appear only on mobile devices or only on desktop devices. So now I'm going through a whole bunch of modules throughout my site the way we build sites, a lot of them only have modules. Uh, so it, it's, it's very modular based and pulling in articles with those modules. Yeah. Anyway, you can talk to me more about that after. But in relation to having all these different modules, these modules will appear differently and display different types of information and even be styled differently because of the advanced module manager kicking in and displaying the different type of content for those different devices. I hope I explained that way. Uh, so, in Joomla 3, uh, who's used Joomla 3? Who, who, okay, good. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but in the modules, you can actually assign different templates to all of your modules as well. So, when you're assigning these different templates, you can really customize the look and feel of each individual one. So, you're not just customizing and then you're using a responsive theme. You can do custom sets of uh, CSS specifically for those uh, modules as well. It's very cool. Absolutely love it. That's probably the quickest and easiest way to um, do mobile content, mobile specific content throughout your website. Now the other way is using uh, browser detection code. Uh, there's a lot of it out there online and you can Google browser detection and you can implement that into your templates of your site. When you implement it into your templates of your site, you can use uh, conditional statements to show different type of content that way as well. Cool. 
Okay, now I lost this slide. Now something that really, really annoys me is uh, when I get a cached mobile site that comes up on my desktop experience. Now this isn't a M dot, like a parallel site. This is some caching mechanism that's breaking the site and giving me a mobile version of it instead. Now if you come across this, you need to change a bit of code or uh, the way that your server works to make this actually happen. And it's called very HTTP headers. Now you can find all this information under the Google uh, developer documentation as well. And I'll post links up to this so you can follow it. Uh, but essentially it tells uh, the server and the browsers to make sure you're considering uh, the user agent, which is essentially what type of browser the user is using. Uh, before sending over a cached version of the website. So if the browser user agent coming in says I'm a desktop version, make sure you're sending me the desktop version of the website and not the mobile one. So it's really important to make sure that's all enabled on your servers and on your websites as well. Yeah, and more details there. Like I said, I'll put up those links. Okay, problems. I forgot something. <coughs> Ah oh, yes, mobile performance. It's always a big thing. And uh, Tenko in the next, next session will be talking about uh, performance in general. But mobile performance is really, really important for your end user. One of the big things that Google's always going on about is the end user experience. And when you have a look at some of the development documentation around building a mobile experience, it's all about the speed and performance and delivery of that content. So make sure when you're optimizing your content, creating specific modules for your website, that you're optimizing those images, you're optimizing the JavaScript that's appearing, you're taking out what's not needed, so you're giving the user exactly what they're expecting in their mobile experience. And this goes back to the planning, understanding what your users are doing on their mobile devices, understanding what they're trying to look for on the mobile devices, and, and building that content specifically for them. Yeah, we all experience slow mobile connections and we all get very, very angry about it. Make that site faster. Okay. And making the site faster will be great for quiz nights. Quiz nights. You know, everyone cheats, don't they, at quiz nights these days? Like the mobile phones, just make sure no one sees. Okay. Um, another tool that can help to speed up your websites or understand what is slowing down your websites is uh, Page Speed Insights. We use this across a lot of our sites, but uh, in a second you'll see that I don't use it on my own. Yeah. Um, who uses this? Not too many people. Everyone, please use it. It's a free tool from Google. It will tell you exactly what you need to do to speed up your website. It will give you step-by-step -step instructions. It will give you gradings and scores against each part of your site. After, uh, for each, each metric of your site, and it will tell you what you need to do. Some of it you may not be able to do, but at least you'll be able to say, hey, this needs to be actioned and ask someone to do it for you. I think I've got on the next slide. No, I don't. But I'll just pull that up and then you can see how poorly my own site actually works. It's nice, quick, easy, but not that quick. I think the server's in the States. But there you can see it's given me a rundown, it's given me a score of 63 out of 100, which is actually pretty bad. And then it will give me the steps and uh, instructions of what I need to do to try and improve this site. So there I can see um, a lot of JavaScript files that probably need to be combined and minified. Uh, CSS, that's all over the place, probably could minify that a little bit more, um, and just using a quick uh, script to compress all those files can really help. And Tanko will be talking about that in the next presentation. I'm ruining his presentation. Leveraging, browser caching, and a whole bunch of other things there as well, so you can get a really good rundown. 
Um, it will also give you the desktop version as well, so you can optimize your desktop experience. And there again, also, it's not performing too well either. So like I said, it's all about the user. Now, um, instead of the, the default URLs that they're supposed to see, what that user will get when they're navigating through the site, the same piece of content has four or five different URLs, and this is like diminishing their page rank. And this happens when you build an m.parallel mobile site as well. So make sure you keep this in track. Have a look at Google Webmaster Tools again and see what URLs are being indexed by Google, Google itself. So now you have some homework. I'm going to leave you with some homework so you can uh, have something to take away and do. Some resources for you. So um, Moz, the Moz blog is an excellent resource in regards to finding out more about mobile optimization and search engine optimization in general. What's that with me? Okay. Uh, another place that I like to hang out is Search Engine Land. Um, there's a whole ton huge amount of articles around mobile search engine optimization there and um, I did pinch a couple of their topics out of this, uh, for this presentation too. Now last but not least, uh, the, the main place where you should be getting all this information is probably from Google Think Insights. This will break down why you should be doing this, how you can do this and uh, different methods of implementing each individual step as well. And don't forget to install Google Webmaster Tools, Google Analytics, and all those other bits and pieces that I was talking about earlier as well. So that's me. Uh, if you want to follow me on any of my social media accounts, that's them there. And uh, thank you. Do you have any questions? First, um, local search, Google put a heap of emphasis on that in recent times. Uh, your opinion, is it still, I mean we should never try and guess Google's actions, but uh, local search, that's a good thing? Yeah, I, I think I lost that slide. Local search is definitely a goal. You still should make sure that you're optimising your websites and clients' websites for local searches, like that Ultimo pizza um, example that I pulled up was a local search. So if I didn't optimise it for local, it wouldn't have come up. I'm sure there's plenty more pizza places around that didn't come up. So yes, do it. I think it's good that there's still a process you have to go through when you do that. You know, it's, it's actually a little bit of hard work. Mm. There's also um, the fact that, uh, you know, going through and setting up a Google Plus profile setting, uh, all those things that Google are forcing people to do now to join their social networks and, and every other part of their Google network, I, you don't really have a choice. You just have to do it. You have to set up a Google, Google profile page for your businesses so you actually come up in those kind of search results. You do have to link your profiles up with your authorship profile. And if you're blogging anything, you, know, you have to link it all up back to your Google Plus account. Mm. That was also in my other presentation, but yeah, cool. So have a look at that, and it talks about Google authorship, which is a huge, another big, impactful thing. Um, in terms of mobile SEO, how important is autocomplete? Because obviously you don't want to be typing as much in a mobile, and most of the time I normally pick one of the top three options it suggests for autocomplete. Is that the phone doing the autocomplete? Yeah, so, or? so when you're you know, searching Safari or, or yep. Google on the phone, um, you know, it's kind of type the least I need to, and I usually just take the first suggestion or two. Yeah. So should you be targeting your SEO around you know, what the top autocompletes are for Google? Anything to improve the usability of a, a person's search, I say yes. Anything that makes it easy for them to get to those particular search results, then yes. And uh, if those keywords are coming up better and Google's suggesting those search results, then I'll be optimizing my sites for those. Should be getting more page views for them anyway. Pretty good. Anyone? Yeah, any down here.
I work with a lot of small groups that you know just want simple statistics, and, and they're not webmasters or technical people, so I don't think Google Analytics really is going to be something they'd be that interested in. They might, might be, because it's a value. But are any of the plugins um, that you see for Joomla that give statistics um, reasonable? Do you know? Because yeah. I haven't had any luck with them, so if you know of any, I'd sure like to hear them. Joomla specific ones. Yeah, there's that. a lot of plugins that you know give you site stats for Joomla, um, but well, some of them don't seem to work, and I'm kind of dubious about how they do work. No, not really. I, I use uh, content stats just to track numbers and uh, usage That's across uh, different components, <coughs> but it doesn't track something like keywords, where they come from, referring URLs, or anything like that. I purely rely on Google Analytics, but now that that's hiding all the keywords and they aren't coming through, I'm finding it a little bit useless as well. So now I don't know what is my highest keywords for various clients. Well, you're also feeding the monster, I mean. Yeah. You know, Google's doing that for a reason. Uh-huh. Yeah. That, yeah. that $100,000 for the data. That's exactly right. I mean, if they can tie all the information on the web together, that's pretty damn powerful. Can you learn that from the keyword planner in AdWords? Yeah, you can, but I, I don't know how accurate that is specifically for what is actually coming in. So the keyword planner will give me an idea of what keywords are uh, really sought after, what, what keywords are getting really high impressions, what keywords are really working well within that industry, and I can optimise my content for it. But I'm not seeing that come back. I have no idea of that unknown search results, and I'm getting uh, a couple of thousand uniques coming from Google, I can't segment that thousand uniques that came in to what keywords they search for. I think we just found out why they're doing it, because then you have to have AdWords to be able to get in there. But that, that would still only give me the paid uh, click-throughs, and only really the organics. You're paying to them. But I want my organic search results. Yeah, and <laughs> Google don't want organic search results. And can people stop just yelling at you? <laughs> try to record this, and, and you actually might want to listen. Maybe we don't want to be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, if, if they're trying to turn around, uh, well, not turn around, but boost their income, then I guess that's, that's, that's what they're doing. Uh, their, their share price hit, what, the $1,000 mark just the other night? $1,000 per share. I wish I bought it all those years ago for $300. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The actual search engineers at Google are also a little bit upset about the fact that it's not being supplied anymore, but the direction that Google came from like right at the top. So um, it's something that's, that's there as a top-down direction and that's just how it's going to be. Just how it's going to be. We can't yeah, do anything yeah, about it. Yeah, no, for the foreseeable future, that's just, it's just not going to change. So one of my clients just came back from the Google um, Partner Conference, and that's what she said. So that's it. That, that kind of leaves us all in a weird position. Yeah, Google is just coming more <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> Other results and other options that we've got, um, Bing tools, obviously you've now got Bing webmaster tools as well that you can submit to. Mm -hmm. Has anyone heard any grapevine that um, Microsoft are actually looking at an analytics tracker as well to then go and rival Google? And then you've also got um, the other things like Crazy Egg now that are going up a direct competition against Google. So is it now that we've got to start looking at other applications like Crazy Egg or Bing Webmaster Tools to now start to track all those keywords? Yeah, we've been using Bing Webmaster Tools now across a couple of websites just to get that information that we've now completely lost. How can we understand how the website's working, what users are coming in on if we can't get that information? And I don't really want to pay that $100,000 if it is $100,000 to get that kind of information. But is Google giving you information across to Bing to get? No, I, I don't think so. They're, they're getting their own through, through their own search network. I'm pretty sure they don't share anything. So you're only getting a small part of the picture. 
Yeah, a very small part, but at least it's given you some clear indication of what that small part is. No? There's another aspect of that, and that is that the people that are choosing to search via HTTPS don't want you bloody knowing what they're searching for. But it's default so, now, you don't have a choice. Oh, you do. They're rolling it out so HTTPS is the default. Yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, people that we're all whinging, we can't know what they're searching. Well, maybe people don't want to know what they're searching. Maybe that just makes it even more challenging. Fun and games, hey? You repeat the question if they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the, by the way, it's called open code because we all work as a community and we all contribute. And so by not putting this on the microphone and not contributing, really, if you go back to the early days of what open code's all about and what Joodle is built on, you're doing the opposite. I don't get it. Sorry. <laughs> Let me just put the microphone. How much time have we got? Five minutes. So we can take a few more questions. Will you take an off topic one? <laughs> Andrew was the uh, first out of that. Um, how much of an effect uh, cookie law is then going to have? Um, and giving, I know in the EU, that now on native deck, you have to give an option to for a user to not allow third-party cookies like Google Analytics. Yeah. Um, Australia is considering following suit. So you then, regardless of what Google does, you know, legally you're going to have to allow people to be anonymous. Mm. Uh, that cookie law is really funny because they really enforced it really heavily in the first few years of doing it. But what I've heard now from the grapevine is that even the agencies that were enforcing it don't care anymore. <laughs> I think it's an absolutely ridiculous law and have not and haven't been declaring that they're <clears throat> checking cookies. That's not necessarily the case though in Europe, for example. Yeah, it was in Europe. It was a UK agency that was pushing for it, suddenly not doing it anymore. I can't remember the case exactly, but I can pull it up for my chat. Yeah, so a lot of like, um, Profile things as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I've got cases where they've uh, they got significant fines for mm. companies. BBC was one of the ones that got caught up in it. So, mm. was was this back when they were f first enforcing it? Yeah, it's about two years ago. Yeah, they've, they've gone so laxed on it now that a lot of them don't even care. It's it's interesting. I don't know how that's going to affect the search engine world in general afterwards. And if Australia does take it up, it's going to be different again, so I just don't know. Hello, Peter. Uh, the uh, Google Webmaster, when you change the page, the URL description, do you need to submit the, the index every time and do a crawling, or, or you need Google to pick up the error? When you're changing the description? Yeah, once you, you update your website, Okay, and you're optimizing it. Yeah. yeah. You can force you, it. You need to resubmit every time you make changes to your, 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 your page ID. From your Google Webmaster Tools or your analytical tracking, you can find out how often Google is coming back to your site and re-indexing it. So if you know that Google is coming back to your site on a weekly basis, then you don't need to force it to come back all the time. You can. You can t tell it to fetch as, like using that fetch tool that was shown before, you can make it go back and fetch the particular pages so they get re-indexed. Uh, but if it's been crawled on a weekly basis, you don't really need so to. So that's the same about the, uh, the, the, the site map, if you update the site map, yeah. you do the same thing? Yeah, okay. very important that you prioritise. Now with the site map as well, you can actually uh, get site maps to uh, index your mobile parallel site if you're going to build that. And if you do have one of those sites, have the uh, relationship <coughs> meta tags within that as well. So when Google is calling your site map, we'll know which one is the, the real one and which one is the mobile version one too. So you can get really refined with your XML site maps. The other thing to take as an advantage with that is also um, you can get applications like XMAP, which generate your sitemap automatically for you, so you don't get the errors creeping into your sitemap when you do make corrections. Um, so it's important, like one of the questions I was going to ask Pete was, what's a tool that you would recommend for sitemap generation, specifically in regards to SEO? Would you prefer um, XMAP or a different thing? Huh. You want to know my secrets, eh? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> tell us, tell us. 
I use a tool called xml-sitemap.com. You can buy a paid version and store that on your server. Depending on how fast your server is, it can index your entire site. If it's a live site, it's going to take a while. But you can use that to generate a sitemap that Google would have more of a, uh, a feel for, I guess. That might be the right word. Because um, XMAP, when you store that, you're defining uh, content articles, menu items, and then using that as your XML sitemap. But what XML-sitemap.com does, and when you download the thing and store it on your server, it will crawl every last single link it can find, just the way Google would. So Google will go to a page and find every last link, great, index it, move on, follow those links, and, and so forth. So XMAP works the same way, so it will find every last single thing that you, that's on your site, that's possible on your site, and you may even pick up some stuff that you don't want index as well. So that's a really good tool in, in regards to getting all that information, but you have to manage it and make sure it doesn't index things that you don't want it to index. It's cheap too, it's like $20. Just gotta know how to install it. Next. Peter, um, it's Tamil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, um, Market Samurai, is that something you would recommend to use or be clear of? Uh, the keyword search tool, hey? Uh, I've used it in the past, I haven't used it in more recent times. Um, I, I guess it's useful if you're building a specific site around a keyword niche, or niche, however you would like to say it. So if you're building a site around um, photography or something like that, uh, you could use it to kind of find a different uh, search phrase that you may be able to compete against. But you can do that with um, you know, AdWords Tool Builder. Um, they've changed it recently, so it's a little bit different now. But you can use other tools that are out there that don't, doesn't cost what? Is it $300 or something now? Yeah. Um, there's other ways of doing it. Um, I didn't find it that useful because there are other tools that can do it. Yeah. I just use it to find different niches and different keyword phrases so I can redefine my target uh, so I can get better traffic and um, with less competition. Mm. I have no idea how much it costs. If it was cheap, then yeah. That's it, we're out of time. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.